All right, uh, everybody, it looks like um, we're here at lecture 45, and it's if it seems like the last few lectures have just been a whole lot of big stuff condensed into one lecture, you're right. Um, and I'd like to say that that's not going to happen this time, but I would be lying to you. Uh, we're, today our lecture is going to be on World War II, and World War II is just absolutely colossal. Um, so we're j really just going to try to boil this down to the nuts and bolts of the war and, uh, and give you a flavor of, uh, of World War II as a, as a topic. Um, and then we've we got to move on. So uh, let's, without further ado, let's uh, move into this. Um, so what we're going to do, analyze the causes, progression, and consequences of U.S. entry into World War II. Now, as you may very well know... <clears throat> Um, World War II started without the United States, of course, uh, depending on who you are and depending on where you, uh, um, you know, what your perspective is. Uh, World War II, you could say that World War II started in, uh, in Manchuria when the Japanese invaded in Manchuria and then ultimately crossed the bridge into China. Um, usually in the United States, we usually put the beginning of World War II at September of 1939 when Adolf Hitler and German forces invaded Poland. Um, of course, uh, Europe had been trying to avoid another world war. Uh, Adolf Hitler took advantage of that um, and, um, and took advantage of the fact that European powers were willing to appease his expansionism uh, and... Um, and, and ultimately, he's going to uh, push that appeasement a little bit be beyond what, um, what Europeans, what Britain and the France were, were willing to do at the time. He invades Poland, um, ultimately uh, cuts across... Um, you know, cr cuts across into France, uh, very relatively quickly takes over France, uh, leaving Britain as the as the last real European uh, uh, nation to stand up against the uh, Nazi Germany. Of course, uh, the Soviet Union who had a uh, a non-aggression pact with Germany. So, uh, so we have the, we have these things going on at the time. There's an awful lot of confrontation going on at the time uh, with Japan uh, on a uh, on a quest for conquest in uh, in China and of, and. Uh, Later on, Nazi Germany's uh, uh, conquest of continental Europe. So what was the United States? What was the United States' position at this time? And ultimately, the uh, Americans, for the most part, really did not want to get involved in another World War I. Uh, their experiences in World War I were mostly negative. Um, and in fact, at the time, there was, uh, there was actually a commission uh, that, was, that, that had come into being in the, in the Senate called the Nye Commission. Senator Nye was in charge of this commission, and, and, and an awful lot of information was coming out about um, um, many of the lies that were told uh, leading up into World War I by the administration, um, the, um, the profiteering that went on as a result of uh, World War I, and people were just really disgusted with the idea that they were involved in this war. Um, so they really wanted to stay out of it. They wanted to maintain uh, isolationism. Um, now, we, the United States is going to have some foreign concerns, but uh, if we take a look, this is a Gallup poll that was conducted in February 1940. So uh, at this stage of the game, you know, uh, uh, World War II is well underway, well underway at this stage of the game. So um, if it appeared, the, the poll is, the question was, if it appears that Germany is defeating England and France, should the United States declare war on Germany and send our army and navy to Europe to fight? Um, and the overwhelming majority of Americans are saying no. 77% in this poll are saying no, and only 23% are saying yes. This gives you an idea of just the isolationist uh, mindset of that time. Now, the United States does have some foreign concerns. Of course, uh, there are foreign concerns going on in Latin America. Latin America has always been considered by the United States to be a sphere of influence. Um, however, as you recall, before World War II, there was not an awful lot of money. It was, it was a depression. And, uh, and the focus of uh, the United States was in its domestic affairs and getting the economy turned around. So um, the President Roosevelt at this time had what he referred to as a good neighbor policy with regard to Latin America and kind of opening up um, relations with, and being a lot less uh, uh, ham-fisted with regard to Latin American countries. Um, but there was also the spread of fascism. Uh, fascism is a political belief system in which uh, the, uh, the state takes responsibility for taking care of the citizens, and in return the citizens give their entire loyalty and devotion to the state. Uh, there are th this idea of uh, liberal democracy, uh, lowercase uh, liberal democracy, 
uh, the idea of rights and all that other kind of stuff it goes by the wayside. And, um, and uh, the, these uh, very powerful leaders, these powerful dictators of both Italy, in Italy it was Benito Mussolini, of course. Uh, in France, you're looking at Adolf Hitler. Um, let's see here, Mussolini. Hitler. These guys are saying, hey, look, we will take care of you. Don't worry about a thing. We're going to take care of everything. We're going to make sure that you have food, place to live, a job. Um, and all you have to do in return is just give us all of your rights. Give us all of your privileges and do everything that we ask you to do. Uh, that's kind of the idea around, uh, behind fascism. And also this was uh, interpreted, uh, so there was kind of a version of this in, uh, in the Soviet Union, a version of state communism, uh, in which the, the state was going to give everything to the, uh, to the people, and in return the people gave its, its dedication. Um, and um, it, it, I, as far as practical realities, this seemed to work pretty well. Um, Italy and Germany did grow their, uh, did become much more powerful during this time period. They did grow their economies during this time period. Um, but freedom was not something that that um, that freedom as we know it was not experienced in these in these countries. Um, and of course, Japan was uh, in the process of expanding the, at this point. So um, and again, the United States does not want to get involved in this war. In 1930, uh, the United States uh, passed what was called the New. Neutrality Act. Of course, this was a time when this was this was a time when um, when these uh, when the, these uh, many of these fascist uh, countries uh, were starting to expand and move move off a little bit. Japan was uh, expanding its uh, its holdings in, in Manchuria, um, and the United States says, "Look, we just don't want to get involved in this." So we, we were guided by this Neutrality Act. Uh, of course, um, the Roosevelt understands here, and he kind of understands at this point that the United States is ultimately going to have to be involved in this war. Um, we couldn't just stay out of it. The neutrality was not going to work for the United States before World War II any more than it worked for us in World War I. We start to see some of the things that Roosevelt starts to put into, into place before World War II. Um, one of those, of course, was the Lend-Lease Act. It was, a, uh, was kind of a law that was put into effect to kind of allow uh, the administration to, let's face it, we still want to support uh, Britain, especially when the Lend-Lease Act was, um, was passed. Pretty much Britain was it. Britain was the last holdout against Nazi Germany, and American, uh, American politicians especially started to think, ooh, wait a minute, this is kind of a bad deal. Um, so the Lend-Lease Act was a way by which uh, war material and, and funds would be uh, loaned to Britain with eh, kind of skirting around the idea of neutrality. Um, also, uh, Winston Churchill, the Prime Minister of England, and uh, President Roosevelt are also going to get together, and they're going to come up with something called the Atlantic Charter. And this was the idea, uh, the, behind the Atlantic Charter was the idea of how was the United States and Britain going to promote democracy and, um, and, and liberal ideas of freedom and human rights uh, after, the war, after World War II. Of course, this is presupposing that the United States is going to be involved in World War II and is going to defeat Germany during World War II uh, when the Atlantic Charter was actually put into effect was before the United States had entered World War II. And it was not clear that the U.S. was going to be involved and certainly not clear that Nazi Germany would be defeated. Um, also to the United States, uh, this is clearly not neutrality, but when uh, Japan does invade China, uh, the United States is going to put a quarantine on Japan and say, all right, we're no longer going to sell you any of the goods that you need um, to build your industries. Iron, uh, uh, oil, rubber, things along those lines. You can't have those things. We're going to quarantine you. We are blocked off. This was kind of embraced by the United Nations. Of course, Japan simply said, all right, well, we're just not going to participate with the United Nations. And we're going to go out and get these things anyway. Uh, Japan has plenty of, I mean, China has plenty of coal. There's rubber in the Philippines. There's the things that we need in the Pacific. And the only thing really standing in the way of Japan being able to get all the things that it needed was the United States Navy. Well, um, that is going to be taken care of at the Battle of Pearl Harbor the, uh, in, uh, in December 7th, 1941. Uh, the um, pretty much the entire U.S. fleet, uh, for the most part, was uh, was parked and stationed in Pearl Harbor, Hawaii, which is a, 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 a harbor, a very large uh, waterway um, leading into Oahu, the island of Oahu. Uh, and in, in December 7, 1941, Sunday morning, very brilliant uh, strategy on the part of the Japanese. Uh, they sneak attack. They attack the U.S. Navy uh, ships that were just parked, and there was nothing that those ships could do. I mean, it was a Sunday morning. 
Uh, these ships are parked there. Uh, they were all kind of bunched in, and they were literally sitting ducks for American, uh, for Japanese torpedo bombers. Now, these torpedo bombers were an interesting new innovation. What the Japanese decided to do was set uh, torpedoes on the bottom of their planes and the pl have the planes fly very low to the water, drop torpedoes into the water, <laughs> explode the... Uh, the uh, ships from the from below the keel, um, it was a, it, it worked fabulously uh, and uh, and destroyed pretty much the entire uh, U.S. fleet or de destroyed or damaged much of the uh, the U.S. Pacific fleet fleet except for the uh, aircraft carriers which were too large to get into the harbor the uh, Enterprise the Yorktown the Saratoga and the Hornet um, these were not destroyed Germany. Uh, of course, Japan's goals at this time was to get the U.S. Navy out of the way and ultimately to start at one of probably one of the most impressive conquest uh, campaigns in world history. Uh, within a relatively short amount of time after the uh, defeat of the U.S. fleet and the destruction of the U.S. fleet in Pearl Harbor, Japan starts to spread south. Uh, they move, they, they rush through China, they, they rush through um, the uh, Southeast Asia, they take the Philippines and drive American forces out of the Philippines, uh, holding a number of American soldiers prisoner, um, those that were able to survive a march across the Philippines, the jungles of the Philippines, and what became known as the Bataan Death March. Um, those uh, soldiers remained prisoners right up until the, uh, they were liberated in 1944. Um, they swept down into Borneo, uh, New Guinea, and were planning on an invasion of Australia. So we're talking about a very vast uh, West Euro, uh, Western Pacific Empire that the Japanese had accumulated in a relatively short amount of time. Now, obviously, on December 7, 1941, um, the United States was clearly attacked. Uh, Franklin Roosevelt goes to Congress and says, hey, look, we need a declaration of war against the Japanese. This is a day that will live in infamy, a very, very famous speech on the part of uh, Franklin Roosevelt. Congress acquiesces, of course, and declares war against Japan. When... Um, when uh, Japan, uh, when the uh, United States declares war against Japan, for some reason, Adolf Hitler uh, decides that he and uh, and Italy are going to live by their particular pact, um, and they are with Japan, and they are going to declare war against the United States themselves. It's unclear um, why he thought this. He may have underestimated uh, America's ability to. Um, you know, to fight. There's, uh, you know, he's he's credited with having said that the United States was incapable of making anything except for, uh, you know, consumer goods, uh, washing machines and automobiles. The very same technologies that could be put into making washing machines and automobiles um, can also be made into putting, you know, building planes and bombs. It was a gross underestimation on his part, and also. Um, he wasn't known for keeping his promises. Why did he keep this particular promise? Yeah, there, there could be many, many answers. Of course, one of the promises that, that uh, Adolf Hitler does not keep was the promise that he made with the Soviet Union, the non-aggression pact. Um, he will invade the Soviet Union in an attempt to take over the field, uh, oil fields and, and uh, wheat fields in the Ukraine and, and uh, to, uh, to gain what he referred to as Lebensraum, or living space for the German people. Um, the... Uh, the United States declares war against Japan, and they pass what, be, what was the War Powers Act. The War Powers Act gave the President of the United States just unprecedented power to conduct this war. Uh, this, this, is, this was a major, major war. This is the United States going to war against not one, but two major world powers. We can't forget this. This is somewhat outside of our experience. Um, you know, just imagine two major world powers in the United States is fighting against them. Historically, uh, as far as our ex personal experience is concerned, the United States has fought many wars uh, during uh, during my lifetime, but they were never against major world powers. They were always against kind of uh, relatively weak powers. So, um, so this was unprecedented, and the entire society, the entire country, just like in World War One, had to be dedicated to fighting this particular war. It was a total war. Uh, Tremendous propaganda was put out there. Just about every movie, every radio play, every um, every bit of writing was dedicated to uh, to uh, dehumanizing. Of course, the same standards of propaganda that we see in World War One, dehumanizing the the enemy, um, making an understanding that losing this war would mean the end end of everything that we love. I, I'll, you know, all of those we covered that in the last lecture. If you want to go, or in the World War One lecture, you can take a look at that. Um, also, we have to fund and we have to pay for this this war. So we put out liberty bonds, and the United States just starts to dump money into into building this war, into fighting this particular war. Um, it actually turned out to be a huge New Deal program. 
And it was kind of what Roosevelt saw it as, as kind of uh, the third New Deal uh, was World War II. And, but in this case, it was relatively easy to get the money to fight this war. Anytime the president asked for money, it's for the war. Okay, you got it. Let's do it. And unprecedented amounts of money was being pumped into the, uh, into the system. And consequently, the, um, the, the Great Depression came to an end. Everybody had a job. Uh, if you weren't a man who was shipped off, who was being shipped off overseas to fight either J the Japanese or the Germans, uh, then you were working in the factories. There was almost no unemployment during this time, um, and that was true also for women entering into the uh, into the scene. We'll talk about that in just a moment. Uh, also created was uh, was something called the Office of Strategic Services, a precursor of the CIA, the United States' first truly formalized uh, uh, international spy agency uh, under the leadership of William Wild Bill Donovan, uh, which is a fascinating history in itself, which I may do a, a separate lecture on just for giggles uh, later on. Um, but on the home front now, uh, the, uh, the home front has got to be dedicated to fighting and winning this war. So, um, so the, uh, the wartime economy was pretty much a full employment economy. Uh, all, almost all of uh, U.S. industries were dedicated to winning the war. Uh, consumers were restricted into what they could buy. Uh, goods, and, and, uh, goods were rationed. Uh, goods like tires and rubber, um, auto, um, uh, gasoline, um, sugar, meat, fats, butter, Everything, all of these things were rationed, and you would get a ration card. When you went to the store, they would pull the tabs on your ration card, and uh, until you got a new ration card, you couldn't purchase those products again. Huge, huge levels of sacrifice among uh, among Americans. On the other hand, um, wages were able to go up. Uh, in fact, wages and got capped because of the fear of the, the shortage of labor, uh, driving the labor wages too high. Um, but people were also able to start, you know, people, of course, going uh, off to war were able to, you know, get a surplus of money. Um, women, especially, who were going, who were working at the factories, just like World War I, large numbers of middle-class women, African-American women, uh, Mexican, uh, Latino, Latino women, uh, going into the factories and working and, and making wages, and these wages, they couldn't buy stuff. Uh, you know, they, they were rationed as to what they could buy, so what did they do with the surplus wages? Well, they put the, the money aside. Um, we also have large numbers. Look, there was a huge labor shortage, and we needed men on the farms. Uh, American men were going off and fighting, so the United States goes into Mexico and says, hey, we need Mexicans. Um, Bring in as many of the la uh, of Mexican laborers as we can into our into our agricultural fields, uh, and work w with what was called the Bracero program. So large numbers of Mexican Americans are going to be brought into the United States at this at this point. Um, this will become a real problem uh, in uh, in Los Angeles. As a matter of fact, in uh, in the early 1940s, we'll see something happen break out called the Zoot Suit Riots. Uh, these Zoot Suit Riots were, uh, uh, you know, Mexican men were coming in in, in Los Angeles, and again they were working, uh, and they had a popular uh, fashion called the Zoot Suit. It was this kind of flamboyant suit cuffed at the collars. It was uh, just imagine your. Um, Stereotypical 1930s uh, suit with a big floppy hat. That's your zoot suit. It was very popular among Mexican uh, men. And uh, sailors uh, who were stationed in Los Angeles at the time, some of these sailors were coming from places where not at all, they didn't see a lot of racial diversity. They weren't in, coming from multicultural centers, and they're looking at these uh, you know, Mexicans in the zoot suits and saying, well, wait a minute, that's kind of, uh, you're kind of flashing uh, this stuff in front of us, and you're kind of insulting us. Uh, so uh, all, you know, at one point, about 200 sailors are just going to go off into uh, East Los Angeles and start attacking uh, anybody that they see in these zoot suits. Uh, the federal marshals are called in. They shut the whole thing down. Um, they actually make the, wearing the zoot suit uh, illegal. Um, and, um, and American military personnel were restricted from certain areas in Los Angeles where th that had heavy Mexican um, you know, uh, folks living there. Uh, things are also not easy if you happen to be a Japanese American, and, and, and California and Hawaii had large numbers of Japanese people. Uh, all of the, many of these people were Nisei. They they had, they were uh, Nisei. They were people who uh, were born in the United States of Japanese ancestry. They were they were just as American as you and I, um, and uh, and yet they were Japanese. They looked differently. 
um, uh, as a result of, uh, of, uh, of reports of Japanese incursions and what was called fifth column uh, threats to the United States, J these Japanese were rounded up under Executive Order 90, uh, 9066. Franklin Roosevelt said, let's put them all in concentration camps and just get them out of the way so that they're not a threat uh, to the United States. So the hundreds of thousands of Japanese Americans were uh, hoarded and, uh, and um, put into concentration camps, and they stayed there for a considerable amount of time. Uh, a, a lawsuit was brought all the way to the Supreme Court, Korematsu versus the United States, in which um, the uh, Supreme Court, which you can always count on to, uh, to offer a regressive opinion, um, pretty much said, yeah, hey, look, you guys are a threat to the United States, so in a time of emergency, the president has the power to lock you up, even if you've done nothing wrong. In the meantime, um, a Japanese, uh, Japanese brigade uh, regiment was fighting in Europe and was one of the most uh, uh, decorated, uh, if, not, if not the most decorated single uh, military unit in, uh, in World War II. Uh, African Americans also are going to have... Um, they're going to see this as a bit of an opportunity. They're not going to see this quite like uh, like they did World War One. They're going to kind of learn their lessons from World War One, and they're going to say, "Hey, let's use uh, since we are needed, we're needed to fight this war, and we're needed in the industries. Let's use the fact that we have all of this power to actually make make something happen." And, uh, and in 1940, uh, in the early stages of the war, I want to say 1942, A. Philip Randolph is going to threaten to um, you know to to create a national strike of African Americans, and Franklin Roosevelt says, "Oh." Wait wait a minute, we can't have a national strike. What do you want? And, um, well, we want, uh, we want free, we want equal access to these government contracts and these government, federal government jobs, and we want equal pay in those uh, federal government jobs. And um, President uh, Roosevelt puts into effect Executive Order 80, 8802, and uh, will also create a, a fair um, the Fair Employment Standards Act uh, that will uh, that will mandate that uh, African Americans get equal treatment and equal access to federal jobs. Um, so uh, and this was also the beginning of a, of a group called the Congress of Racial Equality, which was uh, which was an organization, uh, an activist organization. Um, there's a, a primary source with regard to somebody. I'm not going to read it. You can read the uh, primary source. Uh, yourself, because I want to move on, and we're about 20 minutes into this in, into this deal. Now, Europe. Europe is a real problem. Now, uh, the one thing that the United States and the Allies have going for them is Stalingrad. Uh, is the uh, the Germans had attacked? Uh, it's Stalingrad is right down here. Um, but um, the Germans had attacked the Soviet Union, and uh, they had gotten bogged down in the Soviet winter and were really, really bogged down in the Battle of Stalingrad. Now, now Soviets at this point are just getting destroyed. Uh, the German armies are, are attacking them with everything that they have in order to try to break through the, uh, the front at Stalingrad. But the, uh, the Soviets are really doing a very admirable job of fighting the Nazis um, and, and holding them at a standstill at Stalingrad. To give you an idea, over two million uh, people were killed in the Battle of Stalingrad. Of course, this was, this was more than all the Americans that were killed during all of World War II. Uh, in fact, all of American wars combined. Um, but either way, uh, so we've got, the, we've got Germany bogged down kind of there on the Eastern Front. In the meantime, uh, you know, the United States has got to get its, uh, its soldiers and material to England. Uh, and in order to do this, they're going to have to get through and bust through the German, uh, the German submarines and the German uh, blockade around England. And they're going to be able to do this uh, by using sonar and using airplanes to spot and locate the submarines and then attacking and bombing the submarines with, uh, with depth charges. And ultimately, after months of fighting, um, the United States and Britain will win the Battle of the Atlantic, uh, and the United States will be able to get ship its material over to England and start to set up. In the meantime, again, uh, Joseph Stalin is saying, hey, you guys got to jump into this war. You got to invade uh, Europe. And, and, uh, and Winston Churchill and Franklin Roosevelt are saying, we really don't have what it takes right now to invade Europe. Uh, we're going to have to do this in, in another way. And Stalin's like, well, we can't hold out for very much longer. It's really, really, really critical. Well, one of the... Um, once the United States was able to entrench itself in England, uh, the United States and England are going to start a very, very uh, relentless campaign of aerial bombardment of German targets, major cities, industrial centers, railroads, uh, shipping yards, the whole nine yards. All of this stuff is going to get bombed. All of it is a target. Um, and it was pretty much in many of these cities a 24-hour uh, bombing cycle with, with uh, U.S. Uh, planes flying over these cities in the daytime, about 30,000 feet. 
dropping bombs and just blasting the daylights out of these cities. Of course, the British would then fly over at night and bomb these cities. You can imagine living in these, uh, these cities, just undergoing a constant onslaught of bombing. Uh, later on in the Battle of Dresden, the, uh, the bombing will become so intense uh, that it will create a firestorm in which it basically the entire city just goes up in flame, and that flame starts to feed itself on the fuel of the, uh, of the city itself. Um, the uh, World War II in, uh, in Europe will actually start off in North Africa. The um, Churchill and uh, Roosevelt say, hey, we really don't have what it takes to invade fortress Europe, but maybe if we can get into the soft underbelly, the weakness being Italy, they felt. Um, and they're going to start this by invading North Africa in what was known as Operation Torch. Um, and they did so uh, under the leadership of uh, uh, Dwight, David I Dwight Eisenhower um, and uh, some uh, brilliant tactics by uh, uh, George S. Patton and uh, General George Marshall, British general. Uh, they do take, ultimately take uh, North Africa, and they are able to then, from North Africa, establish and set up an invasion of Italy. So what we kind of see here is, uh, is landings in Casablanca, moving across North Africa, um, movements from British positions in, uh, in Egypt, and then ultimately let's get here in Tunis and cross into Italy and invade it, Italy. Uh, the invasion of Italy was actually uh, very, very successful. It was very difficult at first, uh, but will ultimately be, be successful. The Italian people will, uh, upon being invaded by British and American forces, uh, among others, are going to just get absolutely uh, you know, irate with Mussolini, who had basically been their hero for a long time, uh, to the point where the king told uh, Benito Mussolini, hey, Benito, sorry, you are, the, you are the most hated person in this country. Being a hated person in Italy is not a, a secure position to be in, so Mussolini decided to hightail it out of, the, out of town. Unfortunately for him, his train will be stopped. Uh, he will be captured. He and his girlfriend, Claretta Patocci, will be, kin uh, will be captured, um, put on trial, found guilty, and executed. Uh, once they are executed, their bodies will be strung up by the ankles and ha hanged in the, uh, in the plaza square for everybody to see because that's what angry Italians are going to do. Um, now, with the invasion of Italy, uh, Germany was like, oh, wait a minute, we got a problem. So Germany, once uh, Italy acquiesces to, um, uh, to, to, the, to the Allies, Germany has to now send soldiers down into Italy, into Greece, and they have to divert some of their, their resources from fighting in Stalingrad and fighting in the Eastern Front. Um, and um, and that was maybe that just took a little bit of the pressure off of the Soviet Union. Um, who knows? There was also a very brilliant uh, campaign done in which it, a, an entire German army ended up getting captured uh, in, in Stalingrad. Um, and uh, as a result of this, Soviet forces are going to start pushing their way west. Uh, so now we actually start to see Soviet forces making their way west into uh, into the Reich. Um, and this became a really, really good time now to start what was called Operation Overlord. In other words, this is going to be the actual invasion of uh, France and uh, on what was known as D-Day or the Battle of Normandy. The Battle of Normandy is the invasion of France. Um, and I, again, I'm not, I can't get into the details here. I wish I had, uh, and in fact, ultimately, I'll probably do some more videos in which I talk about some of these things more in depth. Um, but after probably one of the most grueling battles, this was, this was by the way, the largest, uh, uh, you know, attack across the English Channel in, in history. And think about it, the last time that there was a successful invasion across the English Channel uh, was 1066. So this was a pretty impressive thing. Ultimately, the Allies do make it. Uh, they, they eventually will liberate France, and they will start pushing their way uh, west. So now Germany is in, is in real trouble. Um, Germany um, does, uh, Adolf Hitler does one last stand uh, uh, and, and actually is able to make the, uh, you know, bring the, uh, the, the uh, French and uh, English and U.S., uh, you know, offensive to a standstill and even push it back a little bit. This was known as the Battle of the Bulge, the last of the German offensives against the Allies in World War II. <laughs> Pardon me, but um, as but it was it was kind of fruitless. Uh, ultimately, after months of fighting, uh, brutal, brutal fighting, the Allies are going to bust through 
and they're going to make start making their way to Germany and making their way to Berlin. Um, so you kind of see Hitler realizes now he's sitting uh, in, in 1945. Hitler is sitting in a bunker underneath a ruined and rubbled city of Berlin. It had just been bombed into non-existence. Uh, he has Russian army coming in from the uh, from the east. He has the other Allied forces coming in from the south and the west. He knows he's a done deal. So uh, he marries his girlfriend Eva Braun, uh, and they uh, Eva Braun and. Uh, takes a pill of cyanide, which is a really brutal way to die. Um, they kill the doggy. I'm not sure why they would kill the doggy, but they kill the doggy, and uh, Hitler himself puts a gun underneath his nose and blows his brains out. Um, and that's the end of Adolf Hitler. Now, during the same time, you've got to understand that at this point, the United States is fighting a two-front war. So this was happening in Europe, but we are also fighting a war in the Pacific. And this was an absolutely devastating war. Uh, devastating, And it, this is a largely a naval war. Now, since World War II, when was the last time we fought a naval war? We, we just don't deal with that. Uh, but this was a largely naval war. Um, and the goal, of course, now the, now the one thing that the United States had going for it was that the Japanese kind of had over-expanded. They, uh, they expanded too rapidly and were not able to provide adequate defense of their territories. They had gained all of this territory in relatively short order. And those people in those territories were pretty resentful of Japanese experience. Now, they uh, originally, one of the ways that the Japanese were able to conquer these lands relatively quickly, like the Philippines, is they were made, they made the claim that they were liberating these lands from uh, European overlords and their European oppressors, and that actually sounded pretty decent to many of these folks. But it wasn't very long before, um, before say, the people of the Philippines and Borneo and, um, and, uh, and the uh, East Indies realized, hey, wait a minute, you guys are just as bad as our European overlords. Why are, why are we letting you, quote-unquote, liberate us? And they started to fight. Um, so, uh, so the trick here is going to be, well, how do we actually get to Japan? We're just going gonna to have to invade Japan, and we're going to have to uh, take them out. So how do we do this? Um, well, especially, too, when you realize that the U.S. Navy had largely been wiped out at, at Pearl Harbor. And not completely, but, but largely. Um, now, in 1942, we are going to get a, uh, we're going to score a major victory in the Battle of the Coral Sea. Uh, the Battle of the Coral Sea is going to be important. It was a huge battle. Took, some of the, these battles are not taken like days. Okay, these battles are taken in many week, weeks and months. Uh, the Battle of the Coral Sea is going to put an end to Japanese expansion. In fact, uh, the, the, the deal with the Coral Sea was to keep Australia from being inv invaded. So we had uh, American soldiers and Australian forces uh, working together, working in concert to defeat the Japanese at the Battle of the Coral Sea. And it worked. Um, the uh, Japanese are not going to expand any further other than that. Uh, we also have uh, the Battle of Midway, which is uh, oftentimes referred to as a turning point in the, in the war in the Pacific, uh, because at this point, uh, with some brilliant tactics uh, by, um, you know, Admiral um, uh, Nimitz here, uh, Chester Nimitz, um, the, um, he was actually able to pretty much uh, just hammer and wipe out a big portion of the uh, Japanese fleet, largely because we had broken the Japanese code and we knew what they were planning on doing. Uh, so then it was just a matter of outmaneuvering them and using planes against, uh, against the ships. We sunk um, almost all, I believe, almost all of the Japanese uh, aircraft carriers, sunk a bunch of battleships, and this was the last time. As a result of the Battle of Midway, uh, the Japanese no longer had an offensive force. Uh, at this stage of the game, as a result of the Battle of Midway, the Japanese are going to have to fight a defensive war. Uh, so this is really, really significant. Um, and uh, now it's a matter of now how do we get to Japan. And the, and the battle strategy that was agreed upon by Chester Nimitz and by the uh, leader of the, um, the South Pacific uh, forces, um, General uh, Douglas MacArthur, we've talked about him before, um, is island hopping. Moving from island to island, uh, strategically choosing which islands we want to attack, which islands we're just going to ignore and isolate, uh, and slowly moving our way uh, to Japan, and getting close enough to Japan where we can start aerial bombardments, and then ultimately an invasion of the island that will, uh, that will force the Japanese to surrender. Of course, this was not going to be something that, that people were looking forward to. Um, 
we are going to fight the Battle of Guadalcanal. The Battle of Guadalcanal is going to be the very, very first uh, major uh, U.S. offensive victory against the Japanese. Uh, of course, Battle of Coral Sea and Battle of Midway were largely defensive, but now we are, this is, we're scoring a huge um, offensive victory. And uh, the Battle of the Leyte Gulf, which was the largest naval battle in history up to that point and since then. We've never seen anything like it before. Uh, other battles, such as the Battle of Iwo Jima, Battle of Okinawa, are going to bring the United States within striking distance of Japan. And um, pretty much at this point, at the Battle of Leyte Gulf, it was, it was clear to the Japanese that they were losing this, this war. Uh, and things got so desperate that they actually started to use kamikaze pilots. Uh, these were pilots who uh, would get into an airplane that was filled with explosives and just enough gasoline to get them to where they were going because gasoline was difficult to come by. Um, and these pilots would fly their planes and locate an American ship and just fly their planes committing suicide uh, into, the, uh, into the U.S. ship uh, to destroy the ship. Now, a lot of damage was done, but, um, but the kamikaze program was an absolute failure. Uh, you ended up losing a lot of men, a lot of material, and uh, to no effect. The American onslaught just kept coming in. Um, ultimately... Oh, the war is going to wind down. So we're talking about 1944, uh, 1945. Um, as, uh, as Allied forces are making their way across Germany, they discover quite a few things. Uh, one of the things, of course, that they discover was the extent of the persecution of Jews in Germany and in German-controlled regions. Now, uh, this was something that was kept relatively under wraps. Um, during the time, although if you were hooked into Jewish sources of information in the United States and in other places in Europe, uh, it was pretty pretty well known, uh, just the kind of atrocities that were taking place against Jewish people and also Roma and homosexuals and mentally handicapped and things along those lines. Um, we, those folks had a really good idea and a really good press, but for the most part, uh, it was relatively restricted. But once we actually started to find these death camps and these slave camps and these slave labor camps <clears throat> and the absolute depredations that we see, as we can see in this primary source of a photograph of a liberated camp, um, and, um, and video was taken, it was very, you couldn't hide it any longer. The, uh, the results of the Holocaust, the German persecution of Jewish people, uh, became clear at that point. Uh, we also have uh, Franklin Roosevelt, uh, Winston Churchill, and Joseph Stalin meeting one last time at Yalta, a city in the Crimea, and deciding, okay, we're, going, we're clearly going to win this war. Now it's just a matter of what, what, what's going to happen as a result of this. And they come up with the Yalta conference in which they make some agreements. Look, the bottom line is that Stalin is, is really ticked. This, now here we have a situation where Germany has attacked and threatened Russia, not once, as in World War I, but twice, as in World War II. And Stalin is saying, hey, look, I can't let this happen again. We're not going to allow this to go on anymore. We need to have a, uh, a sphere of influence in Eastern Europe that is totally under our control, that will put a buffer zone between Germany and the Soviet Union in the event, or Russia properly, in the event that Germany ever decides to attack us. We also want to divide up Germany and make sure, just crush Germany, make sure that Germany is never a threat to the Soviet Union ever again. Now, you can understand, um, millions of Russians were, were, and, and Soviets were, were killed during this war. Um, so, uh, at the hands of Germans, oh, well, millions were also killed at the hands of Stalin, but, you know, we're not going to quibble about that stuff quite yet. Uh, but they kind of have a point. Uh, Germany has been a huge threat to the Soviet Union, so uh, they demand that they have a, their own little sphere of influence. And on the other hand, uh, Franklin Roosevelt and Winston Churchill are saying, we just put out this thing called the Atlantic Charter to justify the things that we were going to do during this war. It's kind of like Wilson's 14 points. We can't just turn our back on, on these countries and say the Atlantic Charter doesn't apply to you. You have to promise that you're going to have democratic elections and you're going to allow these people to establish their own autonomous governments. And, of course, uh, Joseph Stalin says, yeah, 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 I'll promise whatever you want. And, of course, everybody knew that he was lying, and it really just didn't matter at this stage of the game. Uh, at Yalta, they also come up to terms with regard the, to the establishment of the United Nations and, uh, and creating a board that, yes, is going to give uh, all countries a say in the things that go on internationally, but also to make sure that the, to the victor go the, goes the spoils. Um, and making sure that the victors of World War II have a special place at the UN that is going to be secured. We'll talk about that later on. Um, 
It also negotiated, uh, remember, when Germany fell, when Germany surrendered, Japan was still fighting. The United States was still involved in this, uh, in this, this war in Japan. Um, Stalin is going to grieve between 60 and 90 days after the, uh, the signing of the armistice with Germany. Uh, the Soviet Union is going to enter into the war against Japan on the side of the United States and help to defeat Japan. Um, and many people, of course, see this as, uh, see the Yalta Conference as a betrayal of the Atlantic Charter. Uh, and for good reason. Uh, it, you know, many countries were kind of left out to dry. Um, this is going to be pretty much the last um, hurrah for Franklin Delano Roosevelt. Now, uh, Franklin Roosevelt was elected to office in 1932. It, he is re-elected to office for the, uh, an unprecedented fourth time in 1944. Uh, so he has spent his entire uh, life since then as President of the United States. However, he was very sickly in 1944. Uh, he was very sick at Yalta. Uh, you can almost see how ill he was at Yalta. Uh, in this photograph here, and uh, in April of 1945, President uh, uh, Roosevelt will die uh, in office, uh, turning over uh, his, uh, his presidency to his vice president, a fellow by the name of Harry Truman. Um, and Harry Truman learns, hey, your president uh, during World War II, oh, and by the way, we have a super bomb. <laughs> What? What? Uh, yeah, well, we, you got to know this stuff because we're going to have to end this war. Um, finally, uh, well, he's, we're, he learned that there was that uh, Franklin Roosevelt, 1939, had started a project uh, 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 by the behest of Albert Einstein and, and a, a, a Jewish physicist by the name of Leo Gillard uh, to create an atomic bomb. Uh, and this atomic bomb was going to be strong enough to completely wipe out a whole city. It, it basically split atoms and released the energy from, the, from an atom and uh, had a tremendous explosive potential. It was a super bomb. Uh, they were almost there uh, by the time Franklin Roosevelt passed away. And in fact, at one point, uh, Harry Truman is going to meet uh, with uh, Joseph Stalin and the British Prime Minister, a guy by the name of Charles Attlee, um, and they are going to meet at Potsdam, and they're going to have a conference called the Potsdam Conference. Imagine that. And at Potsdam, uh, Truman defines, he, he's given word that the atomic bomb has been tested in something called the Trinity Test and was successful. The United States has a super bomb. He leans over to, uh, to Joseph Stalin and says, hey, look, uh, we appreciate you guys coming into the war, uh, but we have a super bomb, and we're going to use it. And, uh, and Stalin says, well, use it wisely. Uh, what Truman did not know is that Stalin already knew about the bomb. It was a top secret operation, but uh, Stalin actually had a spy in the Manhattan Project. His name was Klaus Fuchs and was giving him information the whole time. Um, but at the Potsdam Conference, uh, Britain, the United States, and uh, Russia, uh, or the Soviet Union, uh, decide that the only thing that they were going to accept from Japan was exactly what they expected from Germany. Unconditional surrender. You will surrender without terms. Uh, this was a huge sticking point for the Japanese. Now look, the Japanese already knew they'd lost the war. Uh, the emperor realized that, that, that the Japanese had lost, and the last thing in the world he wants is for these foreign forces to invade Japan. He didn't know what was going to happen after that. Tokyo has been firebombed. Um, you know, all of the major cities, and most of the major cities in Japan have been wiped out. Um, and, he, you know, the emperor realizes he's lost the war, and he's trying to sue for terms of peace. And what he's getting from the United States and what he's getting from the Soviet Union is there will be no terms. You will surrender unconditionally. Um, the only condition it wound down that the Japanese were really looking for was they wanted to be able to retain their emperor, you know, because he was kind of a religious figure in, in, uh, in Japan. He did not, they did not want the emperor to be removed from his seat. Um, other than that, they were willing to, to, um, to surrender. That was the term that they wanted. Um, and, of course, the response was unconditional. If the emperor stays, he stays. If not, it's going to be our call, not yours. Um, so unconditional surrender. Well, in the meantime, in uh, in August of um, of uh, August sixth, uh, nineteen forty five, the United States will drop the very first atomic bomb ever to be used in combat on the city of Hiroshima. Uh, Hiroshima was largely selected because it was a mostly untouched city; it had not been bombed, and um, although uh, Harry Truman is going to claim that it was a military target, it, mm, that was it. 
that was iffy, except by virtue of the fact that we could say it was a total war and therefore all targets are military targets. Um, a few days later, uh, the Japanese did not surrender. Of course, this huge question as to why the Japanese didn't surrender after the atomic bomb had been um, exploded. We maybe get into that in a later um, in a later lecture. Um, but they didn't surrender uh, for whatever reason. And uh, on August 9th, the United States is going to drop the second bomb on the city of Nagasaki um, and wipe out the city of Nagasaki. Tens of thousands, tens of thousands of people were killed in the initial blast. Tens of thousands or more people are going to die as a result of radiation explosion, uh, radiation poisoning, and um, exposure to the explosion itself. Um, and finally, the Japanese will uh, give an unconditional surrender. However, they w the Emperor Hirohito will be allowed to remain as emperor uh, after the war, and he will remain emperor right until he dies, I believe in the 1980s sometime. He lived to be a very old man. Um, and that was it. World War II, at this point, as a result of the uh, dropping of the atomic bomb, is over. Uh, and so is this rather lengthy lecture. So, enjoy.